Thank you for joining us for the Mayor's Conversation Series, a six-part discussion that focuses on the priorities of our strategic plan 2025. Today, we'll take up strategic priority number three, to educate the whole child. We'll do this through two installments, the first on student programs and the second on student activities. Joining me today to focus on the various programs we have that aim at educating the whole child are Molly Carlin, our Director of our Foundations Program and Dean of Faculty, Patty Montague, Director of College Counseling and the Counseling Office, and Mr. Brian Friel, our Director of Campus Ministry. We'll start first with Mrs. Molly Carlin. Well, Molly, thanks so much for being with us today, and we look forward to speaking with you about our Foundations Program, which is one of the key ways that we make sure to educate the whole child through providing support to our students. Yeah, when I, you know, I think what's unique about Marist, as we all know, is we are a 7th through 12th grade school, but um, our 7th and 8th graders are shoulder to shoulder with their high school counterparts all day long, so we don't have a separate middle school. Um, but middle schoolers are different, and they have some unique um, needs that are different from their high school counterparts. Well, of course, we have to um, attend to each of our students' needs um, as developmentally appropriate based on, on their age. And we just know that our 7th and 8th graders have, have really different needs than, than high schoolers do. And we want to make sure that we have um, an overall program that meets those needs. Um, of course, some of that is academic, but, but a lot of that is social and emotional as well. So what are the ways that we help our 7th and 8th graders kind of navigate each of those areas? Sure, if we start with academics, I think um, it's a great opportunity for our 7th and 8th graders to participate in our college preparatory curriculum um, in a way that um, doesn't um, you know, affect their transcript or, or um, really um, have long-term consequences. And so it's kind of a way to try out all of our classes at Marist in 7th and 8th grade and figure out where um, improvements might need to be made, where there may be struggles. Um, and I think what, the way we accomplish that with our foundation students is by um, putting teachers who are middle school teachers in front of them. And so these are teachers who love teaching middle schoolers, understand um, how to appeal to their um, adolescent needs and wants, but also to keep them challenged and to keep them learning. Um, so I think the, the, the main thing in our academic program for 7th and 8th graders is helping them manage the freedom and independence of a big campus. Seven classes, um, many teachers, lots of different expectations, which are most likely going to be really different from what they experienced in elementary school. And so our teachers are there to guide them help them um, you know, gain those study skills and organizational skills so that they can be successful in our curriculum and in our environment here. Yeah, our teachers are, are sort of uniquely qualified in that way for this work. They're experts in their particular field. They have degrees in the areas of their primary subject. Um, so your science teacher is going to have a science background. Your mathematics teacher is going to have a mathematics background. Um, but they do have that, that love and care and concern for, for particularly the middle school aged child. Absolutely, we say that quite a bit. And the great thing is that those teachers are also available to students outside of class and, and typically are the ones who are very um, much willing to serve as moderators and um, um, house leaders so that they are interacting with the students in and outside of the classroom. And I think that creates that nurturing environment um, because we know that in a, in a big school environment like this, our seventh and eighth graders need a little bit more of a sense of belonging and someone watching out for them. And so our middle school teachers um, definitely are primed to do that. That's right. I mean, they need to know, you know, that in this sea of, of people out there that our 7th and 8th graders um, feel known, they, they have a sense of kind of uh, purpose and identity here that sort of compels them throughout their day and their studies as well. And our teachers are kind of the, the first point of contact for that. But two, I think, you know, in, in all those ways outside of the classroom uh, that they have the activities and clubs that are specific for our middle schoolers, um, how do you see those kind of contributing to our middle, uh, middle schoolers' sense of kind of connection and community at the school? Because of all of the offerings that we have here at Marist, um, our, our foundation students have the opportunity to try new things, things that they may not have been exposed to before, um, robotics, theater, academic team, even athletic teams that they um, might just try out for for the first time. And so I think it just, we provide a space for that to happen. 
Um, and that's where they form relationships too. And so I think the friendships and the bonds of, of community are forged um, in those different choices that they make and what they choose to get involved in. And I think many of them are, are surprised at where they land. So something that they may not have expected becomes their thing at Marist. And the, the great thing about our foundations program is having two years to sort of figure that out and then um, you know, continue on with something that, a passion that you've discovered um, through our extracurricular offerings um, in high school. And that's so important and why we aim at the whole child is because we realize that, that kids need the opportunity to just experience things to figure out, you know, does this connect with me? Does this make sense for me? Does this feel somehow a part of my identity and being and something I want to be involved in for, for the rest of my time here? And so you'll see any number of kids, um, you know, joining all sorts of teams or clubs or activities that they'd never tried before um, just to see, is this, uh, is this something that there, there might be some calling in me to do and participate in? And we facilitate that very well, I think, by providing time during the school day for activity periods so students can be involved in clubs and activities and, and go to those meetings and kind of do that exploration in addition to their after school commitments that might take them, you know, off campus right away or, or to practices. And you know, um, the other big um, component that I see as, as pretty integral is involvement in our campus ministry program. So our students are not um, they don't have to wait until high school to get involved in retreats. We have a retreat for our seventh graders and, our, and one for our eighth graders, and they are highly, highly popular and, and well attended. Um, and, you know, and that, in, in addition to the opportunities for service that exist for seventh and eighth graders, kind of round out all the offerings that we have for them. Of course, a big part of, of seventh grade when you have um, 150 students coming from dozens of, of different schools and different experiences and backgrounds um, is, is helping them kind of come together and form kind of a cohesive sense of, of self as, as a class. And so what are the ways the Foundations program really assists with that? Yeah, I think the, the centerpiece of the Foundations program is our house system. And that is a way to take this big campus and make it a little bit smaller for our students, a little bit easier to manage. We call it like a community within a community. And so when students come in as seventh graders, they are assigned to one of six houses. And all of our houses are named for um, places or sites that are significant to the Society of Mary. So they get to learn a little bit about the significance of the name of their house and, and how that um, is related to the history of Marist. And that house um, meets during the time set aside for homeroom, which is usually about three times a week. And um, the purpose is to support one another. So the house leaders are some of our middle school teachers, also um, counselors and different um, staff from around the school who are just interested in being um, a part of the of the foundations program and every house has a male and a female house leader and during homeroom um, we spend time together so we get to know one another um, we help each other we help each other navigate the schedule help each other prepare for tests that are coming up and really just spend time getting to know one another and that group that house that um, that that seventh graders are placed in will stay together in eighth grade as well and so those bonds of community get pretty strong by the end as well as that identity with the house um, we every year we have lots of events um, through houses but one is um, an annual um, house competitive games it sometimes takes place in the winter sometimes other times of year but um, when we're doing that on campus, upperclassmen will walk, walk by and they'll remember what house they were in and if their house won the house games that year. And so I think that, that piece of identity of belonging, both to the people in the house and um, the house itself, is, is, is just a way to, to make a, this big place a little bit smaller for our 7th and 8th graders. Sure, and it's uh, you know, a big part of being a middle schooler is just having fun, and, and they all enjoy and have a great time doing the, the winter games and, uh, and that too. And of course, other things they enjoy and have fun with too are, are athletics and the fine arts. And I think in, you know, in both of those ways, they get the benefit of the full Marist experience by participating in these and, and having excellent moderators uh, and directors and coaches, um, but at the same time, do it on a scale that's, a, that's appropriate. So, you know, our middle schoolers are on the main stage at, at Marist School in, in the Woodruff Auditorium, but at the same time they have their own kind of specialized um, drama program from that as well. So how do we help students kind of find their, their fit in, in the things they might be most interested in? I think that really is one of the jobs of house leaders. So we have an activity fair every year and that's one way for students to learn about the different things that are available. 
and you know they need a little guidance you know um, how to how to figure out what I might want to try um, so our house leaders do a good job of talking that through with students preparing them to kind of go through um, all of the options and, and, and kind of have the the bravery and the courage maybe to try something new. Um, I think our peer leaders are really um, integral to that too. So our peer leaders are upperclassmen who are assigned to our incoming seventh graders and kind of start that relationship right after acceptance um, in, in the spring of the year um, before um, they start seventh grade. But those peer leaders really are examples of like, wow, you know, my peer leader plays um, football and also does this activity. Or, you know, I didn't, you know, realize that I could do theater as a foundation student until my peer leader told me about that. So those are the kinds of conversations that go on that I think also open up our seventh graders' eyes to the possibilities. And, you know, they, they get to see some of these things. And so um, when they see our upperclassmen perform um, in the fall, um, and then find out that they would, could have the opportunity to try that in the, our foundation's only spring performance. I think, um, you know, being exposed to it by seeing um, all of the many things that go on on this campus that never sleeps helps them consider some of these, these new activities as well. Of course, one of the, the hallmarks of the foundation's program are its socials, um, which, uh, you know, the, our middle schoolers enjoy. So just tell us about the socials we have and, and, and why we hold those. Yeah, you know, there's always so much going on on this campus, and our 7th and 8th graders fully take part of 90% of it. So they go to football games, they um, are here for different events that we have, but one thing that they can't really um, participate in until they're a little bit older are their, our dances, like homecoming and, and, of course, prom. And so we want to prepare them for those experiences, though, so that um, they, first of all, have the opportunity to have some fun and also sort of learn how to interact with one another at a school dance. Um, and so we, we, um, we actually follow their lead. So I love to work with our foundation's house council, which is like our student council for seventh and eighth grade, to plan um, an event that will be fun for them. We um, have done a traditional dance. We have done more casual hanging out. We have done movie nights. We have done tailgating before a football game. All of this, I think, goes to show the way in which our foundations program lives up to its name. That is, to provide a foundation for our youngest students to be successful um, here at Marist in all the ways that they, they might want to be. As we think about Strategic Plan 2025 and look forward to the future, what are the ways that our foundations program will continue to, uh, to deliver that? I think we just always need to be looking at whether or not we're meeting the needs of the students as they come in, especially as their needs change. And I think um, one main way that we need to consider that are what are their social and developmental needs? What kind of extra support might they need, say, from our counseling office on positive social relationships or um, you know, other, what other kind of programming can we add to what we already do? to provide them with the tools that they need to be successful, um, both here at Marist and, and just you know, as, as um, young people who are growing up. I think another big area there is looking at their study skills and how we can help them, um, you know, maybe even look at providing some um, ways for them to learn study skills and organizational skills for those who don't kind of come by that naturally. So where can we build that into our day? Where can we build that into our classes? So those are conversations that, that we have a lot about how we can improve what we're already doing. Um, the other areas I think are, are, are making sure we're meeting their needs outside of the classroom. So are we providing the right mix of activities and athletics? Um, to keep them interested and, and challenged? Um, are there um, different avenues that we might want to explore with them, really based on, on student interest? And so um, those are, um, I think, some, a, a great area of potential for, for future planning for foundations. Well, very good. Molly, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's very much appreciated and uh, appreciated you sharing so much about what makes our foundations program a distinctive one at the school and a meaningful one for, for our seventh and eighth graders as well. Thank you for having me. And now we're back with Patty Montague, Director of College Counseling and our Counseling Office. Patty, we're so glad that you can join us today and to share all the ways that our counseling office supports our students. I mean, one thing I think we both can agree on is being a kid these days is harder than it's ever been before. There's more pressure, more challenges that young people face, um, and it just sort of calls into relief just how important uh, a, a counseling office is in helping young people respond to all of those pressures. So just say a bit about you know, your observations about how the Counseling Office offers um, support to our students in, in all of the, the personal, social, and emotional ways that they might need. Yeah, 
the counseling office is actually an office of eight professionals and a counseling assistant. And we're very fortunate to have that level of support from the school and support for our students. Four of those are full-time personal and academic counselors. So every student that comes to Marist is assigned to a personal academic counselor that will stay with them throughout their high school career. Of course, one of the, the foundations of Marist is that we're a community who look out for each other and care for each other here. How does that play out in the, the social and emotional programming that comes out of our counseling office? Transitioning to a new school can be hard for a student, whether that's seventh grade, ninth grade, or the students who come in at other grade levels, eight, 10, 11, or 12. So the counselors try to you know, introduce the students to the opportunities that are available to them here at Marist whether that's getting involved in clubs, whether that's getting involved in um, other activities that they might not have even thought about before. They'll talk to them to find out what are your interests. Are you an arts student? Are you a student who excels in the sciences or in STEM? And try to connect them with people in our community who can help facilitate that um, growth as far as uh, in a social setting um, among their peers. It, they also even help students with how they get along with their peers and how to uh, form better friendships and you know all the things that come along with adolescence. Sure and one of I know the signature programs of the counseling office for a long time now has been Camp 3790 uh, which aims at bringing that that ninth grade group kind of together as, as one class despite you know wherever they may have come from before that to, to kind of solidify in them that that uh, Marist identity. You're at Marist now, you're one of us. Um, talk to me about that program and, and how it's been successful. Exactly, and that was one of the programs that I loved to be a um, chaperone for uh, years ago when we first did it, but now it has turned into a leadership opportunity for our upper level students um, being able to bring together the students who started at Marist uh, as seventh graders and then our new ninth graders coming in to form a more cohesive class giving them a time away from the campus where they're able to actually get to know each other in a fun way, a relaxing way, um, for, form bonds that they might not otherwise be able to coming in as 60 uh, new ninth graders to this 145, 150 uh, seventh grade or ninth graders who'd already been here two years before so it's just a, a, a nice opportunity for those students to, um, to form form their new class together as high school students at Marist. Yeah I mean so much of it is just a, a sense of belonging um, you know you belong here and, uh, and you have a place in helping each student here kind of individually find their place um, find what they're passionate or interested in what are some of the main um, challenges you know, to students these days? I mean, we've seen there's a mental health epidemic um, in, in part because of the pandemic, but, but certainly um, before that as well. What are some of those challenges that you see kids have these days, and, and how does your office help students navigate those things? Getting the, the strategies they need to uh, be able to persevere. You know, one of the biggest uh, skills that is needed for students and that they're looking for is something called grit. And so how do you do when you are faced with a situation that is more than what you've currently, you're, you've had to handle before? So it's kind of having the skills and strategies to, to, to get to that next level of emotional well-being, of being able to manage the next thing that is, is a minor setback on your way to more personal growth. And you know, we talk about mental health differently these days than, than we used to, um, and we attend to it in the same way we attend to our physical health. That is that you, know, you need to pay just as much attention to your well-being um, in uh, your mental health as you do your well-being in, in your physical health as well. How has your um, office really been a part of that culture change to just help kids talk about, um, about their mental health and sort of see it as a, a, a something that deserves their attention and requires it really? 
When I started at Marist in 2007, we were an office of six counselors, and that was two seventh through 10th grade counselors and four 11th and 12th grade counselors. And the 11th and 12th grade counselors managed the personal academic and the college counseling. And once the, uh, in 2011, the shift went to where the personal and academic counselors uh, were their own body and they covered students from 7 through 12, which we think helped students be able to, you know, go in and talk to somebody without them feeling like, oh, my college counselor who's writing my letter of recommendation is the one who is counseling me. And then Marist has made that commitment, and I see that as all part of this, um, the vision for 2025 this year, we were able to actually increase that uh, personal and academic counseling load to four full-time counselors, which is a huge commitment and a huge, um, as far as what we're able to get from students, uh, to let them know that it's okay to come in and talk to your counselor whether that's about an emotional need, a social need, or an academic need. And the fact that we have the college counselors in that same office, it's not unusual for students to be coming in and out of the office all the time. And we hope that that makes it less of a uh, stigma to go to counseling, which is something we might have seen eight years ago, 10 years ago. So because our office provides so much different support to students in different areas, it's an, it's an office that is well used. We also um, started at the High School Club of Active Minds. It was one of the first high school programs uh, around. Active Minds started on a college campus, but it is designed to provide education and reduce stigma around mental health. Our students really benefit from that, that personalized approach that comes from our counseling office to, to help students get just exactly the, the help they need to be um, just as successful as they can be in the courses they care most about and those they might just have to take too. Um, and I know a big part of that comes from, from your office and just getting to know um, each of our students um, so that we can help them in that way. Of course, uh, it's not just the, the young people here that we have to educate on all of these things and support through all this, it's their parents too. So talk to me about how the counseling office works with parents to teach them um, you know, how to parent in the 21st century, um, and I know that's a challenging task. Yes, it is. Um, we've had parenting series in the past providing a wide variety of topics from social media to handling stress to helping your child with homework. We also provide a lot of education around drugs and alcohol through FCD, Freedom from Chemical Dependency, um, as well as Parenting with Love and Logic. So there are a variety of programs that come out for, to help parents as they support their students at Marist. And all that's aimed at helping young people be successful here at Marist, um, but let's focus on how we prepare them for success in the future in, in the college search process as well. Um, so tell us about the college counseling office, Patty. So every student, as I said, gets their personal academic counselor as a seventh or a ninth grader or whenever they enter Marist School. And they are assigned a college counselor in January of their sophomore year. And that, at that point, that college counselor will work with the student and family on scheduling for the next two years and that's kind of the first touch point and and that that program at the end of the sophomore year is really just about what to expect for the next two years because part of it is we want to give them a timeline kind of tamp down the stress a little bit to let them know we know what we're doing and that we'll we'll get you through but we've got a class coming up, the seniors, who in the fall we really have to focus on and we really focus on intently. I, I will kind of carry it around to the junior year though. That class then we ask just to, to wait, hold off. If they need us, of course we're here. Call us, schedule an appointment. We have a really good scheduling software program and so any free time that we're available, we will. But we ask them to hold off till December, after term one of the, the year, so that we can work with the seniors. And then in 
Uh, December we'll do small groups. The counselor, the college counselor with the students one-on-one -on -one will do some small groups with them. And then we, it, it be, gets really down to the nitty gritty starting in um, January where we do the college kickoff and then we start with the family and student meetings, we're doing scheduling meetings, they're looking at summer opportunities, so there's, there's a lot through that junior year, testing, um, giving them, uh, helping them with their testing plans, and then around to the senior year, and uh, going into the senior year, we offer application workshops for the common application, a lot of those over that time, so any student who wants to do it can do it before school begins or right after school starts. We work with the English department offering essay workshops so they're able to come in and uh, workshop their Common App essay. Uh, we, and, the, and the, that fall we are there and reading through applications and helping them create a list, create you know, the, the application plans, when should they apply. You know, obviously our, our students um, do very well in college admissions and we're so um, pleased and proud of, of all of the schools they go to. We're especially pleased and proud of how well they perform when they get to those schools. And I know a good bit of that, that future success in college is really working with them to help them find the right fit. Talk to us about, about finding the right fit. Yeah, helping a student know, not say, what school are you interested in, but what are you looking for in a camp campus environment? and having them know that there's more to fit than just, it's the pennant I want to have on the wall. It, it's about the size of the school, the support opportunities, a financial fit, um, a distance fit. I mean, there are just so many things to talk about. And we're so fortunate in that we have so many college representatives who come to visit Marist, usually over 150 in a year and students are able to actually talk to those representatives and about what they have on those campuses and maybe decide. And I guess I would just say the proof of all that is that in the end our students will apply to over 200 different colleges and they attend over 70 different colleges. And you know, I know this year, in particular, through the pandemic, we had students apply to more schools than, than ever before. And that was already following a, a year where they had applied to more than ever before. How has our counseling office really helped families during the, the particularly uncertain college admissions process this season? We continued to provide um, the opportunity for colleges to come visit with us uh, virtually through Zoom meetings in the evenings. Um, we are, we're fortunate to have over a hundred set up evening Zoom meetings at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. that our students were able to come on, meet with those reps still, um, talk to them. We have been able to provide a, an unlisted ACT test site for our students so that they knew that they had a place where they could come and test when testing was being canceled at so many other places. Uh, we just as much as possible, continue to just want to let them know that they'll have options and it'll be okay. And you know, I know that uh, we would both agree that Marist students uh, work harder than any other students that, that we know of. They learn from the best teachers we can imagine in a curriculum that is uh, designed just for them to, to learn through. And, and all of that, I know, tells a, a great story of Marist School and what, what happens here academically. How do you share that story with, with colleges and college representatives? Yeah, we, we, we are very fortunate in that Marist is pretty well known, but every year there are new admissions representatives at colleges, and they, they don't know us. And so what we have is something called the School Profile, and it is there to provide the what the mission of the school is, special programs that we offer at Marist, along with our grading scale, our statistics, uh, what is required for graduation, and colleges use that so that Marist students are compared to Marist students and what, are, what is offered within their context here at Marist, and not that a, a blanket expectation 
that they have the same opportunities that students from any other school or that other students have the same opportunities as our students have. So thinking about the, the Strategic Plan 2025 and the shifting sands of college admissions, how will Marist students continue to be on solid ground in the future, Patty? So it's important that our office continues external communication with colleges and universities around the country that we continue the relationships we have with schools that um, we have been the Atlanta area uh, site for many colleges in the past when they have wanted to reach students from around Atlanta because we're so welcoming to them to use our facilities. So schools like MIT have done their uh, Atlanta area information sessions here, Carnegie Mellon, University of Michigan, Notre Dame, Boston College. A part of it is that external part to help c kind of continue the relationships and just have the knowledge to be able to continue to educate our students about it. So one of the things uh, we started this year, kind of part of that strategic plan was thinking how we could get more colleges uh, FaceTime to Marist students younger and one of those things was we started a series called Benefits of Attending um, to kind of highlight colleges that are in specialty areas. The experiences that we're highlighting are benefits of attending a women's college, benefits of attending a Catholic college, benefits of attending a historically black college and university, and benefits of attending a public honors college. Well, we know just how important the college admissions process is in, in helping students um, launch from Marist um, to whatever's next and best for them in their lives. And I appreciate that all that you and our college, uh, as well as personal and academic counselors, do to help our students be successful here at Marist and be prepared for success beyond. So, Patty, thanks so much for being with us and sharing that today. You're welcome. We turn now to the spiritual development of our students, which at Marist is the centerpiece of all of the education and experiences students receive here. I'm glad to have Mr. Brian Friel joining us for that. Brian, thanks so much for being with us today. You're welcome. So it's just as important that we develop our students' um, faith life and spirituality as it is their um, academic life or their athletic life. Um, how does the Campus Ministry Office offer opportunities um, for students to do just that? Well, we start the day with prayer, and that's coordinated through Campus Ministry, but it's not something that we generate. We schedule it, and we invite um, all adults and students in the community to start the morning with prayer over the public address system. So as a community, uh, we start in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that, that practice of prayer is so important, especially for young people to learn today, um, to, to practice being in relationship with our God um, and to have that um, foundation ready um, as they go through you know, life and work here at Marist, but, um, but also beyond as well. Of course, another essential component of that is, is liturgy. Um, so talk to me about how the Campus Ministry Office um, provides uh, liturgical opportunities for our students. Well, every morning uh, the Marist Fathers uh, offer mass in the chapel before school. Uh, so that's an option for students and faculty to participate at 7.30 each morning. Um, and then um, once a month we gather as a whole community uh, to pray together and most often that's with mass and then at certain times we offer a prayer service as well. Um, for example, at Advent or uh, during the Lenten season uh, to offer a different type of prayer for our school community. Um, and we involve students in every aspect of that. We have student lectors, we have students um, sing and play the instruments, altar servers, ministers of Holy Communion. We try to involve students in the various aspects of liturgy so that they uh, are ready to jump in when they're needed uh, in their school community or their parish community and so that liturgy isn't something that's done by other people but it's done by the community that's here. I know another um, sort of key or signature area in your office is the retreat program. Um, and so tell us about um, you know, how our retreats help our students, again, come into closer relationship with God. Sure. Yeah, the retreats are fun to talk about because they're um, voluntary. Uh, they're not required. And students um, show up. <laughs> they show up in great numbers. 80% um, of each class 
typically participates in their class level retreat. And when we look at the graduates, uh, each class that comes out of Marist, um, more than 90% of them have participated in at least one retreat. So we offer retreats at each grade level. The seventh and eighth graders have their day of reflection on campus, and those are led by 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. The high school students are encouraged to go off campus and participate in the retreats um, specific, again, for their grade level, um, culminating with the Emmaus retreat, which is for 11th and 12th graders, which creates a unique mix. It's the first time that we um, blend two classes together, and so seniors and juniors gather together, pray together, share together, um, and that way that tradition can continue because the juniors who go on that retreat learn from the seniors, and then once they become seniors, then they become those leaders. One of the really unique um, components of our retreat program is that they're entirely student-led. Tell me, what, what do you see as the value of having our own students lead the retreats? The students have the opportunity to share their faith with one another. And um, I know you're a dad and I'm a dad and we can talk all day long, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the students uh, or the, our children are gonna listen to us. But the, when a peer steps up to speak, then their ears really do perk up and they can speak directly to the experience of young people at this time, um, which um, is just a great benefit for that retreat experience. When I say student-led, it also includes several weeks of training. One of the great things about Marist and campus ministry is it's not just located in one office and it's not even located in the tremendous staff that we have of five people. The retreat program involves 18 different adults from around the campus. There's theology teachers and history teachers and math teachers and um, people from other parts of the campus who work with the leaders uh, for several weeks before the retreat prepping them with uh, what questions to ask and how to handle different uh, or difficult circumstances within the retreat. Reminding 11th and 12th graders what it's like to be a 7th grader and how much energy there is in that room because even in those few short years they forget what it's like to get 6 or 8 7th graders all together and, and keep them focused. It's a powerful statement about how valuable our students find our retreat programs that there's so many who sign up to lead them and uh, participate in them. Why do you think that is? Many years ago, uh, a Marist brother at the time, who's now a Marist father, um, began the Emmaus program with some sophomores. And what they wanted to do was create a space where students could be themselves. Um, at Marist, we strive for excellence. And that means in various ways, from wearing a uniform to academic excellence to excellence on the sports fields, they are striving to meet an ideal, uh, setting a goal. But a retreat is designed to not have goals, to have an experience of God and to let God love us as God created us to be. And the retreat is able to create that space so that students can be accepted as they are, reminded about how much God loves them, and just have that brief respite from their phones, from their expectations, from their parents, even from their teachers, because the small groups are led by students without an adult present. So, so much of this, you know, our, our spiritual practices through prayer, through liturgy, through retreats, um, speak to our Catholic identity. But how do we also um, use each of those as a way to share our Marist charism, those things that are distinct or unique to the Society of Mary? Many of the retreats enact those principles. And one I think of is the ninth grade retreat where parents are invited to drop their students off at the retreat center. And um, as they're being dropped off, the retreat leaders welcome them and bring them into this new space, this unfamiliar space. Some of these ninth graders um, are only a few months uh, new to Marist, um, and so they're looking for their place to be and their place to fit in. And so the leaders bring them in, start them playing you know, various games on this open field and uh, tell them where to put their, put their gear for, for the evening. And um, so in that way, we enact the Marist value of hospitality. And so a number of the retreats will mention um, the core values of Marist spirituality, but I'd say almost more importantly, they 
enact those values. And what are some of the other ways through your office that, uh, that we enact those values and, and bring those to bear so that at the end of a student's four or six years here, they're just well steeped in what it means to be Marist and they're prepared to go out and be Marist in the world? Two of the charisms of the Marist spirituality are service and a missionary spirit. And we encourage those through our community service program. Seventh graders are required to do four hours of service and that can be either direct or indirect. And that requirement increases and changes over their years here at Marist. So as I mentioned, seventh grade can be four hours of direct or indirect service. Going up to 12th grade, where there's 12 hours required, and it's of direct service to those who are in need, because the Marist spirituality includes relationship. And it's not service to sort of check a box, but it's service to grow in our relationship with God. And that happens um, in a real way when we're in contact with the people that we are serving. Yeah, that ministry of presence um, that comes with direct service is, is really what I think is most Marist uh, about our service requirement. Um, uh, the Marists go out beyond the boundaries of comfort, beyond the boundaries of themselves, and they seek others um, in need. Um, and they sit beside, they walk beside, they act and pray beside um, those they find there. And, and I think that's one of the things that really stands out about our service requirement to me is the number of hours may be fewer um, than, than one would expect, only 12 hours. Um, but that type of service is what really makes a difference. And it's the kind of service we want our students uh, prepared to do when, once they graduate here too, um, to go out into the world and to be with those who are in need and, and to help meet those needs too. Yeah, you bring up a good point with that number of hours because it does seem pretty small. And, and when we do tours and we tell new families, they say four hours per term and you now it's four for the year. And as you mentioned, it's for those specific types of hours. We want the students to participate by that missionary spirit moving beyond their comfort zone, meeting people that they ordinarily might not bump into um, so that they can see the face of Christ in those opportunities too. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things that we do to try to embed um, that, that Marist spirit in, in our students beyond service is we have an annual rotation of, of Marist themes each year so that over the course of a student's career here, they um, have the opportunity to learn about, to focus on, to reflect and pray on um, particular values of the Society of Mary. Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how that works? Well, one great example of that is this year, the theme that we're focused on is ardent love of neighbor. Um, and we introduce that theme at the beginning of the year um, through our assemblies. Uh, we touch upon that theme through various prayers. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it through our morning prayer at different times. Um, and our academic programs will adopt that as well. I was just reading our faculty newsletter and it included information about the uh, seventh grade science project where they were exploring the impact of pollution and they studied the water crisis in Flint River, Michigan. And after studying that, um, one of the reflection questions was how is ardent love of neighbor reflected in this crisis? And uh, I just thought that was a great way for seventh grade earth science or environmental science to incorporate the theme. So again, it's not just campus ministry um, as, a, as a single department or the single generator of the Marist spirit, but it, it pervades throughout the school. And you brought up an interesting point that uh, it's not just the students here who can, are in continuous spiritual development, it's the adults too. And just as we attend not only to the intellectual needs of our students, it's not only the professional needs of our faculty and staff, it's also the spiritual needs. And we are sure every year to build in opportunities um, to come together um, as a community of adults and, and pray and, and reflect on things like the Marist theme as well. Because ultimately what we want is for every Marist uh, faculty and staff member to be equipped and to be prepared to model and to demonstrate um, what it means, what it looks like to be Marist. Um, because at the end of the day, that's the ultimate sign of the success of a graduate, is one who goes out and knows how to put into practice the love of Christ in the Marist way as well. 
And another way that um, the adults around here influence uh, the young leaders at Marist School is through our peer leader program, that program that pairs um, our newest Marist students, those coming into the school, um, with someone who's been here, a student who's been here for a while. So how do we see um, you know, the adults sort of forming that, that leadership quality in our students through the peer leader program when it comes to leading in the Marist way? Well, one of the key aspects of um, Marist spirituality is hospitality and recognizing the dignity of each person as created in the image and likeness of God. And that um, spirit is carried through the peer leader program. Um, as you mentioned, each year we welcome 200 new students, and um, how tough can that be? You put out a welcome mat, you smile, and say welcome, and you show them where their locker is, and show them where the cafeteria is, and they should be good to go. But in the Marist spirit, we go much deeper than that. And we challenge our 11th and 12th graders who have gone through an application process, um, and they go through an extensive training process for weeks to reflect on how they can see um, God in the new students and to welcome them as they are, not to fit in um, according to a certain category, but to celebrate their gifts. Well, your office is a unique gift to our Marist community, and, and I know that um, each of those programs you just outlined makes a real difference in our students' spiritual growth and development. What do you see next, you know, guided by our strategic plan 2025? Where do we go from here in the campus ministry office? The strategic plan has three key priorities for campus ministry. One is spiritual practice, another is community service, and the third is dialogue. And for spiritual practice, um, one of the ways that we're going to pursue that is both through um, modern and traditional ways. And so the digital space has certainly opened up during um, the COVID pandemic, but it's also a place where our students in a way live um, in that in that digital digital realm and so there's many different retreats and um, Instagram areas where uh, we can convey the faith but we've also uh, started um, a more traditional practice um, here at Maris on a regular basis of adoration and um, sort of what could be more traditional than that. And it's a great balance because, as I mentioned with the digital world, there's so much distraction and energy and it's happening right now. And adoration is a time to just be quiet and um, students respond to that. The other priority that I mentioned is um, community service. And we have a robust program, but we also want to develop that and integrate that so that it's more um, intentional in tying in the Marist spirit. And we've paired with theology. Uh, this year they've, they've instituted a seventh grade Marist Way program, and we've incorporated service into that so that students not only understand that it's required, but they understand why it's required and why that's part of, of the Marist spirit. And we want to do more of that incorporation and even incorporate some of the service into the school day because students' schedules are getting so, so busy um, that we can make service part of that educational time. Um, the third area is dialogue. And this is a theme that Pope Francis has um, developed from the beginning of his pontificate. And um, we relied in 2020 on a program that came from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops called Civilize It, which encouraged us to dialogue um, as an expression of love of neighbor. Um, because we know uh, the Good Samaritan parable where we're encouraged to love our neighbor, but can we love those who disagree with us and can we do it in a civil way? And so we relied on the programming from uh, the Bishop's Conference for that. Um, we're also reflecting on Pope Francis's Fratelli Tutti, his latest encyclical that calls again for dialogue and to recognize the oneness of humanity and that we, that we share this, this um, planet together. And our peer leaders, those students who welcome new students um, to the Marist campus, they will participate with uh, a group called Fearless Dialogues um, that Marist has been working with for several months now. And um, they will uh, be key players, uh, key students in that program where they will um, be trained in a way to dialogue about difficult subjects and do it in a respectful way. And then they'll be in a way missionaries out to the rest of the community to, to do that. So those are just three of the exciting ways that campus ministry is looking forward to implementing the strategic plan. Well, Brian, thank you so much for, for sharing that and all the ways that your office 
helps to um, form each of our students in the image of Christ uh, and importantly prepare them to go out and form others in that same image too. So thank you for being with us today. Well thank you. It's a pleasure to serve in this capacity at Marist. And that brings to a close this first installment focused on our third strategic priority to educate the whole child. We'll take up next time uh, that education through student activities such as athletics, the fine arts, and clubs. We hope you will join us then. Thank you so much.